So welcome to Zef's public lecture today. We, today we have Dr. Constance Akuogu. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in sociology and gender studies, Department of Public Policy and Manage Management at the War Campus of the STD University of Business and Integrated Development Studies in Ghana. She holds a PhD in sociology from the Newcastle University and the BA in integrated development studies and the MPhil in development studies from the University of Development Studies in Tamale. Among others, she is fellow of the African Science Leadership Program a visiting, and a visiting fellow of the Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Leeds in the UK. Her main research interests are gender power relations and post and decolonial feminist discourse. Today's presentation is based on her latest publication in a long list of publications, Power Anthologies and Gender Resistance in Rural Northern, Northwestern Ghana, published in the Ethnos Journal of Anthropology. So Constance, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chris, for such a kind introduction. And thanks to you all for coming in person and to our global audience across Ghana, SDD, UBIT, in North America and in uh, the UK. Thank you all for making time to join us. Yes, so I'm going to be discussing um, a piece of research that I published with my uh, colleague in the UK, my uh, PhD supervisor in the UK entitled Power Ontologies and Gendered Resistance in Rural Northwestern Ghana. And this is me to, um, to your left in the picture there during the field work with one of my elderly research participants. Yeah, so this is briefly the outline of our presentation for this afternoon. So I wanted to start today's presentation with a vignette that I took out of uh, a conversation I had with one of my research participants. So let me just give a brief um, intro to this um, vignette. It was a day after a forum I held to bring my field work to a close in this community. And at the forum, as I tried to cross check what the data I had gathered over a period of a year, I also tried to find out about the Degaba social norms that govern adultery uh, and the standards that are in there for how uh, women and men are perceived in relation to the adultery taboo. So at that forum, most of the participants who spoke, both men and women, thought that a woman has no right to sleep with another man even if she is no longer uh, together with her husband, she should marry out, go on to marry another man rather than go on to sleep with a man. So this participant is separated from her husband. And up until now, actually early this month, I went back to the steady community and she's still separated from her husband. And at the forum, as if this was an opportunity for her husband to get directly at her, he was very um, vociferous in terms of how he said, no, a woman has no right to sleep with a man even if she leaves the marriage, right? So I did not know that my participant, my friend was also so much hurt and had uh, her own views. So in the morning I woke up, went to her house as she was trying to process Dawa Dawa. I joined her, I took a pistol and joined her. And then I asked for her opinions about the forum yesterday, and then she snapped. I don't agree with them. Both the men and women were pretending. Why should only the woman be blamed for infidelity? Where were the elders? When he beat me up, he chased me outside, threw me on a heap of sand, resulting in a twisted foot. He chased me with two children away even threatening to kill them so that I will have no reason to come back here. He was here enjoying sex with his wife 
Why should a man chase a woman away for almost 20 years and maintain his wife, fucking her, but expecting the woman to go and close her ties? I will also fuck and fuck again. Damn the ghost, damn moral. So I choose to start our session this afternoon with this vignette because it poignantly um, encapsulates the context and the, the GABA social norms that govern women's agency and resistance, as well as the dominant control of uh, the other than human or supernatural power forms in terms of how it exercises power over women's um, sexuality. Yes. So in this presentation, my task is to try to dialogue with existing discourses on gender and resistance, and also the anthropological turn to ontologies or the world of the other than humans. And to see how we can use this to develop a lens to understand um, the Gahaba women's resistance practices, which are filtered through male dominant power forms, as well as uh, this other than human uh, power forms. Yeah, so the presentation will focus on resistance practices as they are exercised within the constraints of exogamous very local marriage practices and the constraints. So an exogamous um, society is one in which uh, the social norms that uh, govern uh, marriage practices are such that uh, upon marriage, a woman moves to live with the, uh, the, the man and um, his agnetic kin. This is actually very local residential party, but in exogamy, um, marriage within ethnic groups or clans, close uh, relations are forbidden. So uh, the, the Gaba people practice exogamous marriage um, system, which means that uh, women or men necessarily marry outside of their own kin group. What this also means is that sometimes women uh, leave um, their own kin group and the support system that it enables in order to join the man and his kin in um, his group. Yes, but despite all the constraints that uh, are enabled or created by the very local and exogamous marriage practices, despite the gendered subordination and the normalized violence that characterize social life in the Gaba settings, um, and despite women often representing themselves as a uh, weak persons or Nimbala in Dagari or Yeme or slave uh, in public discourses, they exercise resistance and power in quite uh, um, complex ways that uh, defy straightforward uh, explanations. So by paying critical attention to the subtleties of power and the other than human entities that shape social life uh, in the Dagawa setting and what I call the marriage space, which is a complex relationships that um, is made up of, uh, first of all, the uh, fiscal space of the home, and all the relationships that come together to um, create a, a woman's lived experiences in marriage. So I'm talking about the relation, the mother-in-law, uh, father-in-law relationships, the brother-in-law, sister-in-law relationship. And a woman's relationship with all of these actors within the marriage space will either work to sustain the marriage or to constrain it. This is my concept of the marriage um, space yeah so i pay critical attention to all of these uh, subtleties in there and then by doing that this study offers us prospects for us to think about re gendered resistance practices in a way that first of all takes into consideration the presence of the non-human beings or other than human ontologies in in the sense that without paying attention to all of this we are likely to overlook some subtle kinds of resistance um, practices. So with, without this kind of careful reading in con uh, contexts that are constraining, such as the Degabes, we may risk misrecognizing resistance or overemphasizing it. So it is not uh, surprising that many um, 20th um, century um, 
feminist scholars, particularly who are not from Africa, but who were studying in African societies, um, missed out on some of the ways that women exercise agency and power in African context. And this led to quite uh, problematic assumptions, such as, uh, for instance, uh, African women are victims of uh, male dominance, African women are oppressed, and all of those kinds of uh, misinterpretations of the way in which power works um, in this context. Yeah. So um, the research methodology for this study was inspired by uh, feminist ethnographic uh, principles. And feminist ethnography brings together ethnographic ideals and feminist principles to uh, develop a framework to carry out uh, research. So feminist research or women's ways of knowing, feminist research treats women's ways of knowing as uh, legitimate kinds of knowledge as, uh, and also women's experiences are viewed as uh, legitimate knowledge. So this is me uh, to the right there with one of my participants and we are processing shea butter manually whisking um, share butter in the, the research area. Yes. So feminist research then gives women, gives the minority groups voices to be able to articulate and tell their stories in ways that matter to them. It locates the researcher and the research participants in the same critical plane, thereby bridging barriers and ensuring that knowledge is co-produced in such a way that um, there is respect for the research participants, uh, es exploitation is limited, for instance, and all of that, yeah. So grounded in a feminist ethnographic uh, methodology, the guiding ethos of this research was to center the voices and experiences of the women that um, I worked with. And I carried out participant observation by engaging in uh, various kinds of activities, as long as the participants were comfortable for me to take part in. So the Dagaba social world is one that is marked by pervasive patriarchal ideologies, normalized violence against women, and also limitations in terms of how women can exercise agency and resistance. So, and often when you ask the women, the women I worked with, each time I ask them, why are women um, so subordinated in society? They will in turn ask, um, no one paid money for the man, but the woman was paid for, alluding to the practice of bride wealth. And bride wealth is just a uh, prestations that uh, the groom's family present to the bride's family upon marriage. And in the Dagaba societies, uh, bride wealth is practiced. So the woman will often say, it is the payment of the bride wealth, which is not supposed to be payment, but then sometimes seen as a payment for the woman. And also the very local residential uh, pattern, which means that the woman will have to move to go and live with the man and his uh, agnostic or paternal king. Right, so the woman explained that together these two uh, social institutions produce subordinate social positioning for women in the Gaba um, settlement. So in daily discourse, right from the first day I stepped my uh, foot in that community to find out if I could even study, the women refer to themselves as Nimbala or a weak person they will often talk about themselves as Yeme, a woman is just like a slave who has been bought to come and help build a family, to contribute into the labor intensive uh, farm uh, work in the marital family. And therefore her agency is quite constrained. Right. Yes, but um, despite all of this, the constraints, with the marriage system and with women calling themselves uh, weak persons and all of that. They also are able to exercise agency in ways that uh, uh, can further our understanding of uh, resistance um, practices. So in daily discourses, the women mostly will say, 
unless a woman recognizes her nimbala or her weak status position and humbles herself, she will not be able to live with her husband and his family. So I believe you can begin to see the context within which the Gaba women perform the agenda, within which they exercise power, agency, and um, resistance. Yet there is another contextual issue that I want to highlight before I go on to discuss the resistance um, strategies. Yes, because the Gaba social wells are complexly intertwined with uh, occurrences that are believed to be in the supernatural realm. So everyday events in the Gaba societies, as in many societies across Ghana and particularly Northern Ghana, are shaped by the presences of supernatural power forms such as juju or magic, witchcraft, and the power of the ancestors. Right, so the Gaba lives are complexly intertwined with these kinds of ontologies and the influence of um, foreign, particularly Abrahamic religions, and also currently uh, the neoliberal capitalist system. And in Ghana now, uh, the huge uh, uh, issue we are battling with is the introduction of uh, electronic levy, which means that if you do a transfers via uh, any electronic system, you pay 1.5% of it um, as tax. So the Tagaba social world is a kind of a, a permeated by all of this religion, but also neoliberal uh, capitalist um, systems. So these uh, ontologies, particularly the supernatural ones, create a lived experience of mystical insecurities. And I deplore this term, mystical insecurities, to refer to the fact that by being in the limelight, by being in public, by being seen all the time, uh, the subjects in this context believe that they expose themselves to persons who might then use these supernatural power forms to harm them. Also, the mystical insecurities I refer to include um, the uncertainty that characterize the fact that you believe that within the inner core of the family, there are actors who might have supernatural power forms and may use this to cause you harm if you act in a way that is not pleasing to them. So in daily lives, in ritual practices, women in the Gaba settings, but also men, have to be sensitive to these uh, mystical insecurities so that they do not upset other people who might then um, use um, these uh, uh, power forms to inflict harm on them, yes. But despite all of this, the women exercise uh, resistance. So by their very acts of resistance, even if in most of the uh, time, it is only behind power in uh, James Scott's sense, these women show that it is possible to challenge marital violence and gendered subordination despite the sphere uh, replications uh, that may attend this. Yes, so two critical considerations uh, are important here. First of all, the strategies of the Gaba women are distinctive in the sense that not only do they target male power, they are exercised within a social context that is profoundly shaped by the presence of non-human entities. As we probably know, if any of us here does research in uh, resistance, gender and resistance, we know that many of the uh, gendered uh, resistance studies scholars focus on a uh, male power. Uh, Leila Abu Logood, um, Sabah Mahmoud, uh, Rahia and Gold, and all the uh, women who study resistance practices in the global south, they focus on male power, patriarchy, and all of that. But this is distinct in the sense that not only do the women in this context have male power to contend with? They also have the uh, presence of other than human entities that they have to defer to because um, if not, then you risk incurring their wrath and you will suffer the punishment. There is also the concept of the marriage space that I mentioned earlier on, which refers to the fiscal space, but also the network of relationships that uh, 
characterize marriages um, in this uh, context. And in that marriage space are also the spirits of the ancestors, people who might have witchcraft, and also people who might be juju holders. So out of necessity, the Gaba women's gendered practices, the, the way in which they carry themselves on daily basis have to be very sensitive to all of um, these uh, power forms there. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So the women in that context then must take care, like I said, so that they don't upset the ancestors because they will just call you. That means you are dead. If you, if you are called by the ancestor to come and answer questions, it means that you, you will die. That's what it means to be called by the ancestors in our context. But also there are consequences. If you upset uh, the male members of the family, you might uh, be beaten. You could even be sent away and all of that. So the resistance practices in this context have to be very tactical in order to achieve the results they seek to achieve, but not to upset this uh, concatenation of relationships and the uh, presences that are in there, right? So our research also contributes to the turn to ontology uh, by drawing attention to the influence of the other than human beings in uh, this uh, Dagaba um, context. So Michel Foucault is one scholar whose work has had great influence on resistance, and uh, power discourses across the globe. But uh, Foucault tends to uh, focus so much on large scale impersonal forms of domination, which are less uh, important to the kind of fragmentary, uncoordinated and spontaneous resistance practices that uh, um, I am concerned with this afternoon. So, um, but uh, despite that, people who appropriate um, Michel Foucault's work including James um, C. Scott and uh, Abu Logood and all others um, are the basis that uh, we um, build our discussion uh, on. Right, so um, James C. Scott uh, in his work um, talks about um, the ordinary strategies that are practiced by the weak, people who are in relative uh, less uh, powerful position and how they challenge domination, uh, for instance, of capitalist systems and uh, other dominant um, power forms. Leila Abu Logood um, talks about uh, also small scale acts of uh, resistance and gendered ones, particularly in her research among the Bedouin uh, of um, Egypt. Right, so resistance practices uh, may be collective, resistance practices may also be individual. They range from silence, for instance, uh, in her study of Northern, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Charlotte um, Sharon Pickering talks about how women asserted uh, silence and went about their work as if nothing was happening whilst their homes were, were being uh, ripped uh, apart by a uh, state. Um, officials. So silences, pilfering, foot dragging, and gossiping, feign, innocence, and all of that are weapons that uh, minority groups have deployed to resist uh, power forms and power structures in uh, many areas. But what is key to resistance um, acts is that um, active behavior, whether verbal, cognitive, or physical and opposition appear to be quite central to the theories who work uh, on resistance. But if you bring this to our um, context, you say that active behavior, for instance, despite um, opposition, you are unlikely to be able to understand the kind of resistance that I will turn to in um, a few minutes. Yeah, so we're here in gold, um, Abu Logood, uh, Sabah Mahmood, Sumi Madhok are all researchers who have uh, drawn attention to uh, the uh, uncoordinated forms of resistance uh, practices that characterize um, lives in contexts that 
uh, Sumi Madhok has referred to as um, uh, oppressive in the sense that there are places that uh, background conditions that are required for negative uh, freedoms are constrained. So imagine from this time of uh, resistance uh, research, it's also the concern um, that um, researchers have in terms of uh, how resistance practices became romanticized. So uh, uh, Abu Logood writes a paper entitled The Romance of Resistance, where she draws attention to the fact that uh, there is a tendency um, for researchers at this time uh, to kind of romanticize, to overly exaggerate acts of uh, resistance, even in situations where resistance actually is not um, uh, at play, right? So um, she writes, despite the theoretical sophistication of many anthropological and historical studies of uh, everyday resistance, there remains a tendency to romanticize it. And then Sumi, uh, uh, Saba Mamu similarly calls our attention to the fact that at this time, social uh, scientists, particularly feminist writers, were so much fixated on locating resistance practices. And Janice uh, Body's work uh, amongst the Zakult is one that uh, Saba Mahmoud uh, really um, draws on to uh, bring us uh, this uh, argument that um, there is so much romanticization or exaggerating uh, resistance where there is none or rather missing it all together where it is exercised. So I am quite mindful of these kinds of concerns uh, with a uh, romanticization of resistance, exaggerating it where it is not and uh, all of that. But also I am concerned that um, there's also a risk of not telling the stories of these women, right? Or uh, removing it from the ethnographic um, record if we do not uh, meaningfully engage with uh, their lived practices and struggles and the resistance practices that are enabled by their context, right? So in this study, I attempt to strike a balance between carefully uh, exploring um, these um, subversive um, strategies and uh, kind of um, um, by not uh, exaggerating them as well, right? So in doing this too, I am also quite um, sensitive to the elusive forms of um, restrictions that uh, are in this uh, context. Right, yes. But uh, in, in all of this, I also recognize that um, power, agency and resistance are all uh, co-implicated. Uh, they are imbricated in the sense that as uh, Foucault uh, famously said, where there is power, there is resistance. And then uh, Abu Logu will say that uh, where there is resistance, there is also power. So resistance is exercised within the context of power. So in that violence, in all of the challenges and the constraints that come up against the woman, there is also still space in there for the woman to um, be able to exercise uh, power and to uh, exercise um, resistance. Right. So resistance studies has been going on for such a long time. And in this study, we try to kind of uh, bring some of it back or to reinvigorate resistance um, discourses by drawing in the literature on the turn to ontology in anthropology. So the turn to uh, ontologies in uh, anthropology gives us an opportunity to be able to understand the way in which as human beings, our worlds are interdignated, kind of intertwined uh, with the world of other entities who are not necessarily human beings, like the plants over there, um, like uh, the mystical beings, uh, like rivers, and all of the other non-human entities, right? So the ontological turn asserts that human and non-humans are, are mutually imbricated 
in, uh, in more than human webs of sociality and uh, action. So for instance, in his work amongst the Rona people of uh, Ecuador, uh, Con, Eduardo Con, uh, explores the way in which humans relate with others, including spirits, including animals, plants, and ghosts in both dreams and everyday lives. So non-human entities have also ontological presence. They have agency. And uh, stones, spirits, poetry, and even scientific objects can all be described as having unique and valid modes of existence, as uh, Eduardo Cohn writes. Right. So the world of this uh, Amazonian runner, um, according to uh, Cohn, is constantly open to beings that are beyond them. And when we bring this to the situation of rural Northwestern Ghana, we we'll see how in both daily and ritual lives, women must be differential. They must respect um, these uh, non-human beings in order not to upset them. Because any misperformance carries potential risk of death or even injury. Human relations with these entities are then real relations that have social effects. So in witchcraft uh, discourse and studies, um, so many times people ask me as a, a scholar in this field, whether you can prove that there's really witchcraft. But the issue, we are not interested in whether there is witchcraft or not. We are just trying to understand the way in which the dominant belief in witchcraft and related uh, other than human entities structure daily lives in important ways. Right, so as I show, the non-human um, and human lives are quite uh, uh, imbricated in ways that have uh, implications for the way what we take to be resistance. Yes, so now I turn my attention to the resistance um, strategies that, the resistance strategies that um, I want to talk about um, this afternoon. So uh, I am not the first scholar to uh, analyze songs for their subversiveness or subversive elements. Um, one uh, famous writer, uh, Leila Abulogud, is one who um, has done a lot of work on this among the Bedouin people uh, of um, Egypt. And uh, Abu Logood analyzes what they call the genuas, like um, short poems, which are nonetheless um, quite uh, rich in terms of the messages that they communicate about uh, emotions, about uh, resistance, and the way that agency and power uh, work in um, that context. So the Gaba women's songs, song, by the way, playing songs are uh, a very important aspect. And I did plan to just play seconds of uh, the song I analyze here, but because I'm not able to present with my laptop, I'm unable to um, do that, yes. But uh, using songs as tropes to drum home messages is quite important to the Gaba social lives. So for instance, um, if there is a young person or, or an elderly man in the community who goes to the farms to steal farm produce, people can uh, kind of um, um, constitute a song about you. And then you will get, they will probably not say Constance, but you will know that you are the one and hopefully that will achieve some results. Yes, but uh, the women's songs that I'm concerned here often uh, focus on husbands who beat their wives or a polygenous uh, man who treats one better than the other um, or discriminate against a wicked mother-in-law or who uh, would always uh, tell lies to her son to beat up um, his wife or wicked mother-in-law who doesn't give uh, an elderly mother-in-law food, for instance, and those kinds of um, issues. Yes, so across the period that I carried out this research in one year, I tape recorded a lot of songs 
um, with individual women during house chores on funeral grounds and also um, during farm work. Yes, so there are a range of them and they are all low profile in the sense that they are performed uh, behind power in Scott's sense in that um, they will not look at the accuser or the wife beater and then perform it, the resistance before you. But in women friendly, women only spaces, they perform this. Just to draw attention to the challenges that uh, women face um, in, uh, in marriage in this context, right? So the songs include a performative drama and singing. And I call them performative in the sense that they are also somehow exaggerated just to get that effect. They are also exaggerated. They are dramatized in quite a, a hyperbolic way to drum home the message that they seek to, to carry. Uh, they also include women sometimes running away or temporarily leaving the marriage space to go to Southern Ghana to do some media, uh, uh, menial work to earn an income and to come back home. Hopefully when you return with uh, uh, some small Ghana cities to uh, carry out a business, then the abuse or the uh, deprivation might uh, reduce if it doesn't stop um, altogether. They also include a dissimulation, right? Kind of disguised interest or faint interest um, in certain things. And I will uh, soon show this, yes. All of these approaches reflect the active role of the other than human in there, in the sense that um, the women are aware that if they were to uh, openly oppose certain structures and certain practices, they might be thrown out. They might be asked, for instance, to go back to your father's house for disobeying uh, the family uh, structures. Uh, the ancestors might come after them if you transgress certain norms, for instance. So they tend to choose this low profile um, strategies. So the first one is a song. And now I cannot play it because um, I, don't, uh, I don't have my computer. Yeah, but uh, this song is about um, a troublesome and a nagging husband. So this is the context of this song. We traveled to another settlement, which is just five kilometers from where I did my research with a group of women uh, to a funeral. So normally these women have groups that they support each other. When you have, um, if you lose someone in your natal home, uh, they will come with you to perform, to entertain, and then in turn you provide them with food and drink. But back home, every Sunday they contribute, they meet, and then they contribute just something small towards this. So when you're, you lose your father, your mother, or any close relative in your natal family, and remember I said they are uh, exogamous, meaning that your natal family will be in another village or settlement, right? So um, the woman will travel there with you to perform, to entertain, because um, uh, funeral ceremonies are an important part of uh, the Gaba social life, right? So this song was recorded in uh, one of those um, um, platforms. And it is, the woman says, that I want to leave the marriage because of the man's persistent nagging, right? And the woman will then uh, think, I want to leave because of persistent nagging, right? So they are saying, I will go, I will go and leave your preferred wife, right? So as the woman in the group continue to sing, this particular woman in the village, uh, who is a victim of domestic violence, and everyone in the village knows, but she doesn't talk about it, came forward, and she's quite thin. And when I went to interview her earlier before this performance, she said to me that it is just, she was not like this, but it's just because of the challenges she's facing in that marriage that she has become this thing, right? So as everyone is performing and dancing, she takes over. And then you see down there, Tacoma, you see, um, this one. Uh -huh. This is her there. Suddenly she interrupts and then she sings because of the children. It's because of the children that um, I'm still here. So um, she 
it's just a song. She dramatizes about uh, her challenges in the marriage and uh, what um, she has been uh, exposed to because of uh, the dominance of male power in that um, context. But what is interesting uh, in this performative practice is the fact that despite her husband not being present, other women were issuing uh, disclaimers saying that I don't want, because they were still even afraid that when they returned to the settlement, her husband might create problems for her talking about um, her challenges in this dramatic way. So there are other um, uh, resistance um, strategies that I have here, like bitter cries of a widow um, who cried any time this uh, young man wanted to marry her forcefully. And then uh, for her, the time I met her, she was uh, 66 years old and she, uh, wasn't, she wasn't married, which means that by choosing this low profile um, strategy, she was able to stay out of a forced marriage. And then of course, there's a young widow, a dissimulated uh, practice who deceives every man because her husband had passed and she deceives every man who makes a, a, any overtures at her that, oh yes, to, to let them think that she is really interested um, in them, right? So once uh, we don't have time, there are others like keeping a pot of urine every night so that uh, no man will even dare come close to your door as a widow. These are strategies that widows um, used um, at this time, yeah. So these are just the range of um, uh, strategies that the Gaba women use. Uh, they may look like I have picked, but uh, this is the case for um, everyday forms of resistance practices. As uh, James C. Scott notes, they are quite uh, uncoordinated. They are fragmentary in the sense that they are not organized or formalized uh, kinds. So um, because of time, I will just end by saying that in constraining contexts such as ours, it is important when thinking about resistance to be able to take into consideration the contextual challenges, uh, the dominance of male power, and also the presence of this other than human ontologies for the way in which they authorize and also deauthorize certain kinds of resistance. So if, for instance, policy and um, development interventions or even women's empowerment practices want to really achieve results in this context, then they should take these kinds uh, into consideration. Thank you very much.